Hello. Um, I know I look Asian, uh, but I grew up in Silicon Valley, and I'm absolutely sure that your English is better than my Chinese. So for the sake of good communication, I'm going to stick with English. Uh, I can say things like, 大家好. Um, so thanks, Ben, for a very nice introduction. Um, as I say, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I did my undergrad at uh, UC Berkeley and then my, my PhD at Stanford. But then right after that, I became a young professor over two decades ago at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Xiangkang Kuchi Dashre. And it is that uh, journey that gave me the passion to talk about something like this today. And I'll give you a little bit of that background. When I uh, went back to Asia for the first time almost two decades ago to Hong Kong, one of my, actually the key vision that I was pursuing was to take what I had learned in Silicon Valley, particularly the innovation, uh, the technology innovation aspects of Silicon Valley, and then try to apply it uh, to Asia uh, with varying degrees of success since then. So before I go into more of the story, as you can see, the, the topic that I want to bring to Strata Beijing, uh, the very the inaugural one, is to ask the question, will China lead the world in innovation, particularly in the area of deep learning and AI, which is what my company works on. Uh, so let me, let me see, now that you've had a chance to look at that title, I'd like to do an audience survey. How many people think the answer is yes? Okay, it's hard for me to see, but okay, not a very high percentage. How many people think the answer is no? Not a very high percentage either. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are not here? <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm going to uh, give you my argument or my observations uh, for this. Having thought about innovation from the Silicon Valley perspective for a long time, and of course, you've read many, many analyses, people coming from Silicon Valley and say, this is how we innovate and this is how the world should copy it. I myself have tried to do that in Hong Kong and in Malaysia to varying, as I said, the degrees of success. So I've, I've spent quite a number of years thinking about what, it, what innovation means. And the one aspect that I want to talk about today uh, first is that let's, let's first define terms. What do we mean by innovation? Because a lot of times we say these words. Okay, so first I'm going to define innovation for us and then talk about innovation in the context of China and then what are the implications from the artificial intelligence perspective. So first, what is innovation? We can take the dictionary definition of the word and look at the root of the word innovation, nova, I think many of you know, is the root of this word and it means new. So if you look at Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, innovation means the introduction of something new or a new idea, a method, a device, right? So with that in mind, I think we all know what this is and we can generally agree that this is a very innovative thing to come out of Silicon Valley in recent years. In 2007, when Steve Jobs first launched the iPhone, the idea of a phone without a keyboard was unthinkable. In fact, it was controversial for a couple of years after that, and people had these competitions of who can type faster, right, on, on a regular keyboard or, or a, on the screen-based keyboard. And then also, the, this large screen with this scrollable interface, I remember when Jobs did the demonstration on stage, everybody say, wow, right? So I think this, we can agree, is very, a very good example of innovation coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, how many people recognize what this is? Google car. Google car, exactly. In fact, these days, in my neighborhood, in Mountain View and, and Los Altos, you can hardly drive late at night. If you want to see these cars come out in, in force, just drive at 11, 11 p.m. midnight, they come out like dozens of them. Uh, and they're all learning. They're learning the road at that time. So this is a very exciting recent innovation coming out of, of Silicon Valley or Google. Not just transportation, but machine learning, deep learning. So these, when one car learns, all the cars learn. That's, that's amazing, right? Now, I'm going to show you the next picture and ask you whether it is innovation. How many people recognize this? Is this innovative? Okay, some people say yes, it's very innovative. How come we don't see this as an example of innovation ever? Right? And I claim it's actually very simple because 
most of us don't care, right? Uh, so this is innovation strictly in the, in the sense of dictionary definition, but most of the world doesn't really care about this. It solves a very specific problem for, for you know, some people and it very, do, does it in a very new way, so it qualifies as, uh, for the definition. So this kind of innovation we don't refer to as innovation because it lacks something very particular. Do you know what that is? It lacks scale, right? So I claim that when we throw around the word innovation and people come out of Silicon Valley and you know, think that I, they know how to innovate rather than because they're just part of that ecosystem, I think we, we don't realize that we use that word multiply by scale, right? And that is really true. Silicon Valley companies that are recognized as innovative tend to work on global scale problems and tend to work on problems that are maybe one, two, three, five years ahead of everybody else. Um, and the reason they work on those problems is because it is their problem. So a great example is Hadoop itself, right? As you all know, this comes from a technology from Google, right? HDFS with GFS, MapReduce, Hadoop, and so on. Google solved its own problem, its own scale problem that it had to deal with when it indexes the entire web. And then sure enough, five years later, that technology as a solution applies to a lot of the problems that the rest of us outside in the rest of the world have. So I claim that bigger challenges will lead to greater innovation, and innovation that we care about, innovation that are significant to the rest of the world. So with that in mind, what does it mean for innovation in China? Okay, how many people in the audience recognize these two gentlemen? Do you know what company they're associated with? Okay, so maybe their faces are not as well known. They are co-founders of a company called DJI, right? Which I believe, you know, if you're from China, you should be very proud of. DJI is, of course, the world's largest maker of drones. Uh, Jian Li is actually a colleague of mine. We came to HKUST at the same time. Uh, he, ca he did his PhD at Berkeley under Latvi Zade on control systems, fuzzy logic. And Frank was a student of Jixiang in, the, sort of in his robotics program. And how many people know the company DJI? Well, I, I would expect it to be much larger numbers. Uh, uh, but those of you that do know about DJI know that they are a very innovative company. You probably don't know that it started out as really in Frank, what, what, what Frank wanted to do was to make better toys, right? Uh, back about 10 years ago in, in, in the lab, in the robotics lab, uh, Jixiang ran a class, and Frank wanted to use the control systems from that robotics lab to help stabilize helicopters. And so they started a company, and that company did reasonably well, maybe one, two million US dollars a year. And then something happened uh, about five years into the company's life, and which is a company called GoPro, right? Uh, GoPro, uh, as you probably know, is it makes these video cameras that you mount on your heads and you can do sports and it, it uh, generates amazing videos while you're skiing and running and playing basketball and, and all kinds of stuff. Somebody took a GoPro camera and installed it in one of these helicopters. And by that time, they made quadcopters and so on. And then lo and behold, right after that, you get these amazing aerial videos that are made by regular people that have sort of Hollywood type effects, right? In terms of the, the, the kind of views that they can have. And so that captured the imagination and sales for the quadcopters made by DJI took off, right? And if you hear the story told by Zhixiang, uh, what they did next was they went to GoPro in the US and they said, hey, we, we make these helicopters or these quadcopters you guys make the best cameras in the world. How about we do this? We do a, a, a joint venture. We'll make everything. We'll do everything. You just ship us your cameras. We'll install on the quadcopters, and we ship them, and then we share the profits. And you know what the GoPro guy said? They said, yes, let's do it. We're going to take 75% of the profits. You take 25 right? And that was actually a very generous deal if you think about the relationship between, say, Apple and, and Han Hai or Foxconn. So Zhixiang and Frank spent a lot of time in the lobby, you know, the whole day there. And then finally they said, no, we can't do this, right? We do everything, and they take 75% of the profit. So 
for the first time, they made a bold move and they said, we're going to make our own cameras. So they went back to Shenzhen, made their own cameras, which is actually turns out to be the easy part of the whole technology, and the rest is history. So today, DJI, this, this data is actually a bit old already, over a billion US in revenues and commands 50% uh, market, percent market share. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the things that you see today in terms of all the drone startups and so on was inspired by, by DJI. And DJI, not only that, has spawned an entire robotics ecosystem in Shenzhen and elsewhere within China. It is extremely advanced in terms of, the, the, the ecosystem is very advanced in that you can take a 3D design in the morning, go to Shenzhen, and in the evening, leave the city with a prototype. So you look at this context, China, everything is huge, right? Certainly the population. You look at the, at the density of the population of, say, Beijing compared to New York City, it's 50,000 people per square kilometer. The trains run amazingly on time. Planes, not so much. But the point is, everything in China, when you touch, when you deal with, with any kind of business challenge, when you build a company in China, you immediately deal with very large scale. And for that reason, companies like WeChat, and again, this data is, you know, the, the actual numbers are now much larger than this. WeChat has grown tremendously, not just a chat application, as you know, now it sort of env envelopes the entire sort of e-commerce online experience for many of its users. So in that context, and then relating that to the field that I work on, which is big data, machine learning, and AI, when you think about deep learning, deep learning needs big data, right? I've, I've said before that the only reason for big data is machine learning. And that's particularly true in the area of AI. The more data, the better the learning. And so China, the minute you scale into any problems that are relevant to society here, you're dealing with extreme scale data. And this is absolutely true of companies like Baidu, Tencent, and so on. And then you take that data explosion, and then also look at what's happening on the robotic side in the example of the company like, companies like DJI. If you look at just four years ago, when you look at the ro robot, robotic shipment in China, it was still behind many countries. Very rapid growth to today, 2016, almost 100,000 units per year. Where robots, and AI combine in the artificial intelligence field, we call that embodiment, right? AI plus embodiment will lead to an age of intelligent robotics that I believe China stands a chance to lead the world. Not just 20, 30 years from now, but I believe very, very soon. Certain major thresholds have already been crossed. And so, in fact, I don't have a lot of time to talk through what I believe is going to happen in the next 50 years, but I'm absolutely convinced that we're in an age of augmentation of human intelligence with machine intelligence. And all of the scale and all of the data that China has will help, us, will help it lead the world in innovation. So with the, are we missing one slide? Uh, in any case, the last slide essentially sums up my conclusion that to the question of whether China will lead the world in innovation with an AI perspective, the question is not whether that will happen, the question is not if, but when. And people like you in the audience here working, just working on the problems of scale, that's why you're here at Strata, just solving your own problems will be major contributors to that development. Thank you very much.